Uh, that would be Elizabeth probably who is smart enough to hit the recording. Um, often, often what I do is I look back at uh, what we talked about the last time and see if there are any topics that um, need revisiting. And, yeah, um, so we do have also a lot of new people joining, so I'm not really sure, should we do like a quick round of introductions? And I see, Karthik, totally. uh, you have I, a conflict at the sign? Yeah, I actually have a staff meeting at this moment, and so I just clicked join meeting, and I ended up at this one, um, but I need <laughs> to be at my a team meeting. Uh, I'd love to join in the future, just Thursday morning at this time is uh, is a booked time throughout the year. Anyway, I'll let you carry on with this meeting. Sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. And thanks for showing up. And I, I guess we can also probably join, um, continue the conversation async either in the Slack channel or the GitHub, you know, um, yeah. repo. So to. yeah. Cool. Bye. Bye. Oh, I was going to say, I think a round table would be very good. Okay. So maybe we can do that quickly and kind of have a very quick introduction of your name, uh, your projects, or what brings you here. Um, and then we can do start the discussions. Does that work? Yeah. So I'll start and I will name someone else to go after me so that we are not sitting in awkward silence. So my name is Melissa. I've been working on a number of different open source projects, mostly focusing on the Python ecosystem. So NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, um, and I'm involved in other stuff as part of my job at OneSite. Uh, I am based in Brazil and I am going to name Elizabeth as right below me in the invite list. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth. I'm the Chaos Community Manager. I've been in Chaos uh, for about three years and I've been in open source for 20 plus years. One of those folks <laughs> who have been around a long time. I've been, um, I used to be a PHP developer, um, moved into community management, but I've always been an uh, open source advocate. I do a lot of work in diversity, equity, and inclusion in open source. So um, that's me. And I will pick, uh, who am I going to pick? That's the question of the hour. Vinod, you get to go next. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. I'm Vinod Ahuja. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I just graduated from University of Nebraska, Omaha. I completed my PhD in IT, and I'm joining Florida Gulf Coast University as an assistant professor over there. So I'm in a transition phase. So I cannot say, like, I'm still at UNO. I'm moving there in a month. So. I'm in this uh, transitioning phase. And uh, as far as my engagement in open source is concerned, I've been engaged in open source for seven years now, and I'm with Chaos since inception. So, yeah. Thank you. Can you nominate someone else to go after you? Yeah, I would nominate uh, maybe uh, Natalia. Am I pronouncing correctly? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you, Lunat. And I'm Natalia. I contribute to Pandas uh, since eight months. I have a um, mass background. Uh, I um, taught students mathematics in universities and did research of about 10 years. But uh, then I decided to switch my activity to more in the direction of IT. IT. I did several projects uh, for Kaggle, in Kaggle platform. And then I started to contribute to Pandas. Thank you. And if uh, if you could pass oh. it to another person. Yeah. Who's next? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, next, uh, mm -hmm. Kevin. Hi, Kevin. I'm... Uh, I, I think you said Kevin, so I'll, I'll go. Uh, I've been with Chaos for uh, seven years as well. I've, I've uh, been here from the start. Uh, I'm at uh, the University of, uh, I'm an assistant uh, professor of computer science at uh, Creighton University here in Omaha, Nebraska. I was at uh, 
UNO Prior, working with uh, Matt German Prey. Uh, open source community health is kind of kind of my jam. So <laughs> I'm here to here to help in any way that I can, and I'm uh, really interested in uh, building healthy open source communities. So, uh, and I will pass it to. Uh, Sarah, have you gone? Hey everyone, um, my name is Sarah Gibson. Um, I work with Project Jupiter Hub as the community strategic lead and I've been a member of that team since about 2019. Um, I'm also a member of the Turing Way project as well and help run mybinder.org. Um, I now work at Y2C um, deploying Jupiter Hubs for um, people in research and education. And I'm here because I went through the CSCCE community management training with Melissa and Inessa, and I'm super excited to see what they've been up to. Um, and yes, you'll see a lot of my cat on the video as well, as it's getting close to his dinner time and he's going to be very distracting and very angry that I'm not paying attention to him. Yeah, so that is me, and I will pass on to Mark. Oh, right, hang on, I'll put my camera on in that case. So uh, my name's uh, Mark Forster. I've been involved in scientific software for many years. I am, I did actually start as a scientist and I do have, uh, you know, many, many research papers, but uh, I'm, I'm now in the role of the community manager for the Open Molecular Software Foundation. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that cer certainly in the past and up to this point, I've, I've, usually been focusing on the the functionality and capabilities of the scientific software and i would certainly like to learn a lot more about chaos and about the sort of metrics that you you have been using to you know quantify the health of such projects okay. i guess you get to name another person mark i do but on this laptop, it's pretty difficult to actually I know. Yeah, see the names, friendly. you know. So yeah. hang on, let me just pick someone who hasn't gone yet. Maybe if I stop sharing the document, that will um, make it easier to What see about people... Inessa? I don't think that she's gone yet. Happy to introduce myself. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Inessa Parson. I'm originally from Ukraine, joining from Southwest Florida. And I posted the message in the chat for Vinod, uh, curious what university you're joining in Florida. Um, I'm an open source program manager at Open Teams Incubator, and I'm a contributor experience lead for the NumPy project, thanks to the funding from CZI. I've been a part of the scientific Python community for over four years, and uh, mainly I've been contributing to NumPy and scientific Python projects. And I will pass on to Abigail. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Inessa. <laughs> My name is Abigail and um, originally from Ghana, but I'm currently based in Cincinnati because I started grad school in the University of Cincinnati. Um, Go back I'm involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm involved. Um, with the Python software community in Africa and I mean other projects as well, I got introduced to um, or I got to know more about the chaos project from Ruth and then also I got specifically invited to this user group by Inessa. So it's nice meeting you all here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm, in this case, I'll nominate, uh, I, I don't know, Roy? Yeah, hi. <laughs> I haven't spoken yet. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Pompier Roy, originally from uh, Tahiti, French Polynesia, and uh, currently based in the, um, Austria, uh, in Wien. Um, I'm coming from SciPy uh, Scientific Python. Uh, I'm a maintainer there and currently working at uh, Quantsite. So yeah, Inessa proposed me the, that I, I would join this uh, this call. And uh, Ruth. 
Hi everyone, um, I'm Ruth, I'm the community lead for Chaos Africa. If you joined earlier the call, you saw a bunch of people. So yeah, that meeting was just ending. Um, and I've been in chaos for I think three years now since COVID, since uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I I I'm curious, so I decided to join the meeting. <laughs> Um, I haven't been, I think I missed the, I, I knew what's going to start, like uh, the, the working group, or I missed the first start. So yeah, I'm here to learn more on how like um, scientific software and metrics, how it comes together. Um, I will pass it to Elizabeth, because I think Elizabeth. I did go, but I will pass it to Sean, because I don't think Sean's gone yet. I think I'm the last one, actually. Um, Sean Goggins. I'm a maintainer for the Chaos Augur project. Um, one of the co-creators of Chaos. I've been around open source since I started working as a faculty member at Drexel University in humanitarian open source software back in 2009. And um, <clears throat> I just uh, so I, I think one comment I'll make as we go into this is I've I've had a lot of ex a lot of opportunity to look at scientific open source collaborating with Chan Zuckerberg Institute for the last five years on the chaos project and also working closely with some of the corporate members of the, the chaos community. I, there are some definite distinctions in, in the ways that uh, software is maintained in the scientific communities in contrast with the corporate communities. And so I, I think this group is is kind of important for helping to define what is a healthy um, scientific open source project because I don't think it is going to look the same as a corporate open source project. <clears throat> That's my thought. I think we're done with all the intros, but although Emmanuel, Emmanuel Briggs just arrived, we're doing introductions, Emmanuel. I don't know if you can say hello. All right, well. Yeah, just, uh, uh, I, I think the floor is open. If anyone wants to open their mic and introduce themselves, that's fine. If not, if you just want to listen, I think that's also mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> um, did everyone go? Did we miss anyone else? All right. Awesome. I think we're good. I think we got everybody. Okay, so I think we can move on. So just for, for those who were not here in the previous meetings, um, we were mostly trying to come up with both the structure of this group itself and how it's going to work, and also the subject of the metrics um, as they relate to scientific open source projects. So I just want to say, you know, last time we were talking, I think Matt is the one who suggested, you know, if there are any initial metrics from the chaos working group that you feel might make sense for scientific open source projects, maybe we can start from there and then build the discussions around it. So what I included there in the meeting notes, and I should probably also paste in the chat, is a document that is um, completely a draft meaning that I just pasted together a few of the metrics that I know from the chaos project and that I feel could potentially be used for uh, measuring health for scientific open source projects. And at the end, I have a, a couple suggestions of potential new metrics that we could use. Um, so maybe we can go through this, but I just want to give everyone a chance to ask questions now if they want to have more context, if they want to understand how the, the group is working and, you know, um, yeah, I'll just leave the floor open for like a few seconds in case you have questions. And you can also feel free to raise hand, you know, you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom if that's available to you. I'm okay, just scrolling so, through this document. There's a lot here. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we, I, so the first part of the document, um, yeah, so the first part of the document is basically gathering some existing metrics from chaos. So what I did was go through the 
existing models um, and choose a few that I think make sense for the scientific open source. So I think we could go um, share your screen. I'm just, I, I was just asking if you wanted to share the screen instead of having you oh. do it that way, you could control what people see. I'm trying to follow, but it, it <laughs> might be easier. Yeah, okay, I can do that. Let me just try. I stop and then I don't I don't know how Zoom works if I have to make you a co-host. I'm a university account. I, I think I can share. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, that works. <clears throat> how do I make this bigger? That's good enough. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah, these are the existing models that I feel might make sense to our projects, right? And again, my suggestions here are based on my experience. Doesn't mean that these are comprehensive or you know that everyone has to agree. Quite on the opposite, I think the the goal of these meetings is to have these discussions and kind of understand what makes sense and what doesn't. So I feel like, for example, the community activity model already makes sense for us. So as how much activity you have on your repo and code changes, activity, you know, issues closed and all of that. So I'm not even going to go through a lot of detail. You can find all of this information. I just copy pasted from the Chaos Metrics um, website. So you can take a look there and see more details. Uh, similarly, for the project engagement metric or, or model, rather, um, so the metrics associated are, you know, committers, contributors, issues closed, organizational diversity. I think all of that can be used to measure project health. So all of that makes sense. And then I bumped into this one, started project health, which I think makes sense here, but I wanted to bring a different perspective. So I know that a lot of scientific open source projects are just getting started and are figuring out how to build their communities and figuring out how to build healthy communities. But we are on the opposite, like, and I say we, because we have at least me, Bonfiel, and Inessa here, who are working on very old projects. So these are 20 year old projects that have a long history and background. And we also want to do this. Um, so I don't feel like we're contemplated exactly here. So maybe we need to figure out a different model that is old project health or like existing established product, uh, project health or something like this. I don't know. Um, just putting it out there. Yeah, I make and a then, comment real quick. Yes, definitely. Okay, so for the uh, for that particular model, the the starter project health, uh, the starter the starter part of that is is meant as kind of a an introduction to four critically important uh, metrics as part of the, the model. So it's not for uh, it's not just for new projects uh, or for old projects. It's for people who are new to metrics and new mm -hmm. to community health. Uh, so this this model was kind of created as a starting point uh, by actually. Uh, 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 someone very knowledgeable in in corp in the corporate OSPO space, uh, she put forward these four metrics as these critically important metrics that if you had to look at just four, look at these four first. Uh, just a little think, background on this metric. So, and, and one observation I have, looking at scientific open source compared to corporate open source, is you would interpret these metrics differently. In mm -hmm. a scientific project, uh, those responses that are slower, sometimes really good scientific open source projects don't accept a lot of pull requests from outside of a core contributor community. So you, you, the signals of what is healthy in scientific open source, I think, are different. So some of the metrics might apply. I think they do. But how, how they're interpreted or contextualized, I think, is what's going to be different. And, and I also think there are metrics we haven't brought up that are important for science. Yeah, definitely. Completely agree. Yeah. So again, I think this is definitely something we can elaborate on. I just wanted to give you a quick look of the new ones that I'm proposing just so that we can have like at least the context of why we contacted Matt in the first place and why we made this connection. Because I think uh, so me, Pamfield, as a background, me, Pamfield, and Inessa were working on this project uh, funded by CCI, 
and we are working on what we call contributor experience. So this term is not new. It comes from the Kubernetes community. They also have a contributor experience team where they try to engage new contributors, make sure that they are um, they have mentoring, that they have you know opportunities to reach out to maintainers and stick around the project. And so this is one that is very focused on the contributor community and their pathway inside the project and how they can potentially over time become maintainers or engaged contributors, right? They don't need to necessarily become maintainers, but be involved in the community. Um, so there's a few things that I know are already covered by other metrics models and other metrics on chaos, but I feel like we could have a discussion with these more focused on the scientific open source side of things. So just like what Sean was mentioning before, maybe we need to like, it's a, a different interpretation of the same metric, right? So I wrote a few user stories that I hope make sense, or at least for me, that's in, in my experience, they are very common. So as a maintainer or a contributor experience lead, which is our position, you can call this differently. Maybe it's a community manager, you know, there are different ways to call this. I want to know if my community can manage mentoring and support for new contributors, including issue responses, pull request reviews, and all of that. But also, as a new community member, I want to know if I can get adequate support from the community. So like we were saying, in a lot of these projects, there's a lot of goodwill and there's a lot of like, we want to have new contributors, we want to have new maintainers, we don't have the bandwidth, or we don't have the knowledge of how to mentor people. And so can we find a way to, to establish that and, and people go into the project knowing what to expect in terms of mentoring bandwidth from the maintainers, uh, responses and all of that. We, we've had a discussion earlier today about you know, taking too long to review pull requests or respond to, to comments. And I feel like this expectation setting uh, is important in terms of project health. And, as an optics side of uh, things as well. Like how do people from the outside understand uh, what are the expectations in terms of responses and you know, interactions in this community? Um, and I would add, you know, I wanna know if I can get adequate support to contribute in a variety of ways based on my experience and background. So not only code, maybe I can bring in documentation, maybe I can bring in community building, maybe I can bring in communication, social media, you know, there's a number of different ways that people can contribute to these projects and how can we best support them? Do we have a structured way of supporting them or not? Um, Anyway, I, I, I don't think I'm gonna read them all because I think that's a lot. So maybe if you wanna take some time, like we can set up a timer for like five minutes or something so you folks can read and then we can talk about a little bit of feedback. Yeah, I, I, I would like to make the point that, um, that just to reiterate the point that was, that was made earlier that uh, the, the metrics that are appropriate depend upon the type of um, scientific open source projects. So the, the projects that I'm, I'm involved in are really focused on scientific applications that are open source rather than tools like NumPy and SciPy, which are designed to help you build applications. Uh, therefore, people that contribute in our community require very specialized scientific knowledge. Um, so we have three projects, for example, Open Force Field, <laughs> open free energy and open fold. And unless you have the scientific knowledge to contribute to those, um, you, you can't possibly be um, a significant contributor. So the contributor base is very small. It's either people that are employed by our projects or perhaps people who are researchers mm. who are um, so minded as to make the outputs of their research open source. And that's the way that the projects thrive. So we may in fact need a very different set of metrics and I you know I don't really have experience of um, you know working out what those are that's what I'm here to try to work out and to discover. Yeah that's an excellent point and actually we have the same problem uh, specifically I, I can point to SciPy and NumPy we also require uh, some background usually at least for code contributions, you do need to have specific background and knowledge and experience before doing contributions. So that makes perfect sense. Um, 
So on this one is more about the contributor experience and the community health, but I would like to scroll down a little bit and maybe mention just as a high level uh, note that the next one that I was uh, that I put in here is project sustainability. And I think it speaks to a little bit of what you were mentioning now, Mark. So it's um, let's say that I have this uh, project that it's a scientific open source project. There are different ways in which I can evaluate sustainability. So on the one side, if I'm a scientist, I want to know if I can trust this project to exist 10 years from now so that my research is reproducible, for example. Um, and on the other hand, if I'm a maintainer or if I want to put out a scientific open source project, I want to know if I have enough funding, mm -hmm. if I have enough turnaround of maintainers to actually keep the project going and the lights on. Um, so that that was my thinking when putting forward this one. And I know that there's sustainability in other contexts, but again, I think here it means something different because there's uh, scientific reproducibility, you know, open science concerns and all of that that we can include in these metrics. And I'll stop talking. <laughs> I, just, I just mentioned in, um this is kind of a, an, an analytical survey, just looking at different applications based open source scientific projects where it's not NumPy or SciPy. There, there seem to, there, there is, there exists, it, it seems, this is just a hunch looking at stuff that <clears throat> there are these acceptable periods of non contribution when the applications themselves aren't funded and they actually come back, right? Like the scientist gets more funding or uh, other scientists involved and so I've, I've just observed that there are like months to a year long gap on some scientific application projects that where in a, in a corporate open source project, that would be an, a significant indicator of death. Um, in scientific open source, especially in this application space, that doesn't seem to be the case, just kind of a hunch. So there are, there's a, that's the difference I've observed. <clears throat> Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, in SciPy, especially, we have a lot of folks who now are working, for instance, for Google or Facebook, and yet they don't get as much time as they had when they were grad students, for instance. And mm. uh, sometimes when they are on holiday, you don't know why, but they are going to say, oh, I want again to contribute. And you are going to see huge PRs coming in. And yeah. well, you need you, now we have a problem because we need to address these PRs. <laughs> yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, and one of the things, one of the, the so science, scientific open source also, one of the, you say huge PRs, huge PRs are tricky. They're hard to merge, right? So when somebody creates, it's, it's training people to make smaller PRs because people are, you know, first, you know, as an academic myself, I had to, I learned the hard way that big PRs never get merged or are, take a very long time to merge. And so you know, I, I, there's probably some kind of education function to help people kind of know, you know, small PRs are good. <laughs> well, I guess the, the, to my mind, the other, the other, I mean, the number of contributions is one metric, but perhaps one of the key points is how many contributors have contributed in the last, let's say the last month or the last year. I mean, I can point you to many open source scientific application projects where the, the code's still very valuable, but the person that developed it moved on from academia to work for a company. And it, it's currently not, you know, I'm afraid it's currently not maintained. It may still have value, but, uh, you know, it, it, it could break and stop working at any, any point, really. Um, yeah, that's one of the, the sustainability um, at that level is one of the harshest uh but but you know most frequently occurring things yeah both you i think that's what that that's a very interesting point because for yeah coming circling back again sorry to to sci-fi um one problem that we have currently is that uh the software is quite stable and some in some modules you will rarely see any contributions happening and in some oh, modules you'll see something happening and so if you have a, a metric which is just looking at the whole repo as a whole, uh, you could get a sense of everything is active and everything is moving, but in some specific part of the software, uh, it's completely frozen. 
So, mm. and but the thing is that you could say, oh, here it's frozen, so it's dead and it's not good anymore. But in some cases, it's frozen, but it's stable and it's because it's included in the whole package. It will still be maintained if it breaks, uh, but it's not just it's just frozen, like in terms of features, in terms of uh, general bug fixes and, and stuff like that. I think that's yeah, that, difficult here to measure the. That's a very good point. That just because it's frozen doesn't mean that it's unsupported. So yeah, that, and it does not remove the scientific validity, as you were saying. Um, mm, of course, uh, cosinus is still cosinus, and <laughs> yeah, math doesn't change. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so when we uh, when we're when we're talking about sustainability, I think we always we always really kind of need to make the distinction between uh, are we talking about sustainability around the community or are we talking about sustainability around the artifact, right? So the the artifact, as long as the artifact continues to exist, uh, you can you can make the argument that it continues to exist and is being used. You can you can make the argument that it's sustainable in some fashion. All right, because anyone can fork it, anyone can take it and use it. Uh, sustainability around community is is what a lot of our metrics focus on, uh, and they specifically kind of look at community activity and whether community activity can lead to sustainability of the of the project. So I know in the in the open science context, not all of these projects are collaboratively developed in open source spaces. And that's where a lot of these sustainability kind of community metrics are, are focused, right? So the, I, I it, in, in understanding the difference between the, uh, the communities, I think we always need to differentiate whether or not we're talking about just the, the software it's being with an open source license, uh, and the uh, sustainability around the artifact, or if we're talking about collaborative design of open source software in these community spaces and they, they're different things and both of them uh i think both of them are applicable for the open science space but it also uh but they're also there there's these different things that we need to understand i, I will be well, and, I, and in the work that we've done with projects in cci i've, I've observed that the notion of community is of varying levels of importance in the scientific open source. Um, or very, you know, there's a high variability in degrees of understanding what that means. So like in the application space where you have a small number of scientists who might be relying on a piece of software, the notion of community isn't something that they even have the capacity to entertain. Um, NumPy, SciPy are different, of course. I just, so I just thought I'd bring that up. And I would, uh, I would add, I, I've worked in that space with you. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. And, uh, and uh, the, the point I would add is that oftentimes mm -hmm. when, what I'm hearing when I hear user, uh, when I hear community is it's more of a user community rather than uh, collaborative design communities, right? Which, which is also okay, but it's, but once again, it's, it's a different thing. Yeah. Uh, so sustainability around a user community is is different than sustainability around a design community. contributor or contributor uh, yeah. yeah or contributor community uh, which is different around sustainability of the artifact in the software itself right because to to um uh, how do you say name come come I'm feel I'm wondering where like uh, what's leading you to to have this impression that the design is not that community driven I'm interested in. <laughs> uh, from my work in from my work in CZI, uh, and so and and by the way, I, I know that the I know that NumPy and and uh, uh, the big uh, mm -hmm. some of the big open science projects are are very collaborative in open spaces, uh, but from from talking to many different representatives of open science projects. I get the feeling that it's more kind of traditional development work that's then being kind of tossed over the wall, if you will, uh, with a with an open source license strapped onto it. Uh, and then when they're building community, they're generally trying to build a community of users around it. Right. Uh, so that's just my general perception, uh, and I, it's not the case for all. And I know for the 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 NumPy folks, I think, are the they're at the 
the cutting edge of the the, the community work uh that that collaborative design stuff so uh uh so i'm not uh, making any statements about them there no i'm just curious about uh, uh about even the the perception that um everybody's having on on everything that we do and what's happening so Folks, I'm trying to capture this in the notes. If I make a mistake or misinterpret something, please let me know or edit the notes directly. That's perfectly fine. Um, but this is great discussion. Thank you so much. So one thing that comes up to me along that conversation, so I added a comment here that we might need to differentiate between community-led and a more centralized uh, project where like decisions are coming from a lab or something like that. So I think that bleeds into governance discussions, uh, which is something that is frequently used as a metric, like how is the governance structured and you know, uh, are there clear, um, leadership roles or can we understand how that works do you think this is important for the let's say the more centralized versions of scientific open source projects or is that like directly coming from how they are structured is that something that they need to document or not like how do we set because my understanding and i don't have a lot of experience with that kind of project so i can mm -hmm. see people coming to the project with an expectation of contributing and then hitting a wall because they don't know um how to move forward with that contribution is that yeah. something that happens is that something we want to address i i think so i think governance is a governance is a big part of uh kind of community building and, and understanding uh, uh, for, for example if there's if there's no path to leadership for a contributor uh, then uh, there's there's very little uh, motivation for them to contribute in a lot of cases right so it, and and open source has those projects as well right where there's that uh, that benevolent dictator leader who you know, runs the project, uh, but but generally, if we're if we're talking about wanting to build these collaborative communities, you need to have paths to leadership, and you need to kind of share the control and direction of the project uh, rather than being controlled by any one individual or institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it seems though that in scientific open source software, sometimes that's just the way that it happens. Like there's not enough resources for there to be more than one institution in some places. Yeah, on men, on, this is Mark again. Mm -hmm. And and would would it be helpful if people say who they are? Because sometimes I find it a little difficult to to know who's sure. I'm, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Something. So, um, so Mark here, I I would say on many of the um scientific application projects which come with an open source license, um. So those communities are often, although those projects are often, I would describe them as the army of the willing. So it's people that have got specialist knowledge in, let's say, chemical informatics. And they're also people who are very good at coding. And uh, they may then contribute to a particular project. But I'm just looking at one online. Uh, and it's still, it's very valuable. It's still, it's on GitHub. It's still there. Um, but it looks like the last contribution I can see was about six months ago. So it seems like it's it's stable, it's still alive, it's still valuable, but it, it doesn't have a lot of people working on it um, every day. That's because those people have got other jobs and, and uh, they're just getting on with, uh, with, with things. And, and in the scientific uh, community we have many many things many things like that you know so also, i guess oh sorry go ahead Nessa. yes i wanted to bring to the to this conversation that we need to be mindful that there are different levels of openness when we talk about open source software including scientific open source so, uh, scientific software. And I think it would be helpful to define what 
level of openness we are uh, we keep in mind uh, when we set out uh, the model mm. develop the model um, open Sorry. So, so I I did some research uh, because uh, at some point I got confused uh, that there are so many uh, projects that call themselves open source, uh, but in reality they are not uh, uh, don't have the same way of uh, making these technical decisions or even um, community governance. And uh, there was a blog by Matt Rocklin, and that's probably the best uh, classification of openness that I came across. If you find something else, uh, please uh, point me to it, because I am very interested in this topic. And Matt identified, and for those who are not in the scientific Python ecosystem, Matt Rocklin is the creator of Dusk. Uh, and he identified six levels of openness. Uh, publicly visible source code licensed for use, accepting contributions, open development, open decision making, and then community owned. And NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and most scientific Python projects are at level six, community owned, meaning that all the technical decisions are uh, happening in the open, usually on the mailing list because we are pretty mature uh, and uh, yeah. mailing lists were uh, the go-to tool for communication when we started. Uh, but uh, I know I know just lots of open source projects coming out of the labs, scientific labs in the recent years, they are not uh, at the same level of openness. So this is something that we need to Keep in mind. Are they are they not open in the sense that they are not licensed with an open source license? Well, they might be not accepting the contributions. Uh, or yeah, so I, you can I, see the code, but you cannot hmm. contribute, or you can contribute, but uh, there is a, a a long solicitation process, and your contribution uh, will. I, I've seen a few ways where there is a code base that is hidden and then there is a fork that is open and you contribute to the uh, fork and then mm. your contribution happens to, uh, is transferred to the main but at that point no one can see who contributed <laughs> yeah i i i mark here again I, I i would just clarify that and say there are two different forms of openness here there's openness of usage which is often specified by the license and there's openness of contribution. Um, and as Melissa pointed out, that can be very different. Often, you know, some scientific applications are just developed by one person or a couple of people in the lab and uh, they release the code. It's fully open for anyone to use, but they're not, they're not, um, they don't have time or, or they don't want maybe to accept contributions more widely. I mean, that's, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, um, I've, I've, this is this is a part of scientific open source. But I think it's actually pretty similar to what we see in the larger open source software space. Uh, <clears throat> you know, for example, let's predate Twitter to Elon Musk. Um, they were, you know, prevent, pretend he never happened. Their open source work was famously closed in the sense that it was really just a, like Twitter bootstrap is a widely used framework for websites. But they really seldom accepted any pull requests from outside a core group of eight contributors, and it's still considered an open source project. So these, there is this ways of having leadership and managing a community or group that that are different. There's like Ruby on Rails will accept tons of stuff from everybody, but okay. Twitter Bootstrap accepts nothing. So <clears throat> like these different patterns are probably all okay <clears throat> as long as the project is maintained. I, I just yeah. that part I think is that I see I've seen like pretty consistently across all kinds of open source. Yeah, this is this is Kevin again. I just wanted to build on what Sean was saying, uh, and in in my previous statements about uh, even sustainability of the artifact versus the community, so I'm not making any value judgments on that. Uh, but uh, to Anessa's point, uh, openness is variable. 
and may, maybe at the at the minimum, it's that the there's a license on it and the code is available. Uh, and then as we as we move on, openness can mean different things to uh, to different organizations. Uh, but the uh, the level of openness that the project has is really based on uh, what the the project or the organization wants that openness to be, right? So if we were to, if we were to measure the the health of a community based on that openness, we really have to take that kind of that context into into account. Uh, for example, uh, I know Sean had mentioned uh, the openness of some different projects, uh, but my, my example would be the uh, the way that Google treats openness in their different projects. Uh, every project that they they work on has kind of a, a different level of openness. For example, Android is not as open as some other things. Google controls it pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tightly. Whereas Kubernetes is a very collaborative environment. So the, the, the level of openness that Google chooses to adopt in these projects is strategic and it varies based on uh, uh, their, their organizational goals. So um, I want to point out that we're reaching the, we usually be on 10 minutes before the top of the hour to give people a chance to do what they need to do before their next meeting. Um, yeah, so if I can just quickly um, mention something on that conversation, because I think it's really important. I think I would put, if I want to measure the health of a project, looking at these different levels of openness, what I want to know is, do they know what level of openness they want to keep? And is that documented? So I think the main point is if I am someone arriving at this project, do I know what level of openness they are at? And do I know how I am allowed to engage with them openly? And do, do I have the right expectation of how that will go? I think that's where I would lead the conversation, acknowledging that we have different levels of openness. Can people identify that? from looking at existing documentation around this project. Um, I think I would put it this way. Not sure if everyone agrees, but yes. The, the, Sean, the thank metrics, you for the reminder. Like, <laughs> the chaos, me I mean, like some of the metrics like uh, pull request mm -hmm. acceptance rate and things like mm -hmm. that would help you know how open a project is. I, I, um, recall, I recall there is a community welcomeness thing that we develop in the chaos that can exactly fit into this context that how welcoming is the community to a new community. Yeah, yeah, that metric model never got delivered because it ended up, it was a very early metric model um, okay. and it contained way too many metrics. <laughs> but I, yeah, it's, it's a, the ideas I think are very solid. Yep. And maybe that's worth revisiting in the next, in the next meeting of the scientific open source community. Do we want to, I mean, it would be great if all the same people or most of the same people were here next time. Um, do we want to make that an, ad, like, what would be the next agenda focus that would be, where do we want to go from here? So if everyone is happy with, um, like, I'm going to propose something and if you're not happy, that's fine. We can do something different, but could we go from this document and kind of edit or give feedback and comment and mm -hmm. kind of come up with if you have extra metrics that you see on the chaos project that you think would fit this if there's any of the metrics written here that you disagree with or just giving feedback on the general idea let's say we want to come up with new metrics models for scientific open source does this make any sense can i propose that is that something we're yeah no, that's a good idea because then we can we can keep collaborating on the document async. People can leave comments. If they can't make the meeting, they can leave their ideas here as well. And I think it would be helpful to kind of come up with, okay, this is what we have so far. This is what we don't have and we wish we had. And then we can start refining on how does that look as an actual metric? So for a lot of things, you notice that I, I added user stories, but I explicitly didn't add metrics because I don't know what those are yet. I think well, that's what we need to refine. And I think that's the conversation that we want to have. But um, yeah, I would ask, like, let's keep the conversation going on this document, if that's all right with you folks. That's a great idea. Good, good idea. Awesome. Um, 
Anything else? No. I think we can let people go if they need to leave now. If they want to stick around, I can stick around for a few more minutes. Then. I'm going to take a break because I got a meeting after this, and it's almost 1 a.m. here. So, wow. See you later. You're very yeah, I'm not usually I'm not, I'm not usually in Japan, but uh, oh, let's see, right? Okay. <clears throat> it's a family trip that's been planned for a long time. So here I am this week. So I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I, I would, as Mark here, I was just going to say the Google example is a very good one. I mean, they have, um, you know, uh, subsidiaries. For example, they have um, uh, a subsidiary company called DeepMind, and they've produced something um, back in, uh, well, probably 2021 called AlphaFold, which is a, a has made you know it's really been in the press so it's a a thing it's a piece of software for ostensibly folding proteins and uh you know that's that's really had a, a very revolutionary effect in the in the scientific community that's interested in protein folding but um as i understand it and i could be wrong uh because it wouldn't cross my mind to contribute to alpha fold it's so technically advanced that i i, I doubt that i could uh, I could contribute, but um, I, I assume that en development is done entirely within uh, within the company, and then they release the code under an open source license. Uh, that that happens for uh, some of their projects, but they're they're actually they're a very mature open source organization. Okay, uh, they do they do a lot of stuff in the open. Okay, uh, so the. Uh, I think Kubernetes was I think Kubernetes was one that they built internally and then open sourced it. Uh, I'm not I'm not certain on the one that you mentioned, but uh, but they're very comfortable working on the open in the open. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not I'm I'm not seeking to castigate them in any way. You know, I'm just um, oh just yeah, flagging up that one example of AlphaFold, which you know is is amazing. Um, you know, it's advanced that particular field um, beyond all recognition. I mean, it's something that scientists have been working on for 50 years, and uh, the degree of advancement is is uh, astonishing. Yeah, for for them, the 